Now, we are getting into the home stretch of a series we've been in for quite a while now. We have been talking about, of course, the armor of God. And we've got today and possibly next week, and I think we'll be done. But this all got started, as I've watched for the last couple of years, how it seems like the world we live in has just kind of spun out of control. And I've watched people fighting with each other and arguing with each other and talking about the greatest divide in American history. And I'm thinking, well, you know, except for the one where 700,000 people died because we were in a civil war, perhaps that might have been a little more intense. But I saw a lot of people in the church getting angry at other people and that becoming the focus of a lot of their attention and a lot of their energy. And I knew that that wasn't right. Once again, there are no asterisks in the Bible. Jesus didn't say, love your neighbor, asterisk, unless they vote wrong. <laughs> That's not there. And so I started praying about it, I started thinking about it, and I started remembering some things. And one of the things that I remembered was the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. And it occurred to me that a lot of us were spending our time and our energy and focusing on something that is not part of the battle. Our battle is not against people. We are in a battle, but our battle is against our enemy, the devil, and his unseen forces and powers. And the truth is, if I'm focusing on the moron that's bothering me, I'm ignoring the real problem. And then I wonder why I can't get anything accomplished. Well, it's because I'm not dealing with anything that I'm supposed to. So we started talking about how we're not supposed to focus on the people we don't like. Then we found a very interesting verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, where it says, this is what the Lord says. Now, when the Bible says, this is what the Lord says. You remember when you were in school and the teacher would rattle on about something, and then you'd figure out that this was going to be on the test, and so you'd pay attention? <laughs> Were you ever one of those annoying students that would say, excuse me, Mr. Jones, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> because the truth is, if it isn't going to be on the test, I don't care. You're wasting my sleeping time. This is what the Lord says. We need to pay attention. Don't be afraid. He says that over and over and over again. Yet so many of his children live their lives controlled by fear. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. Sometimes the army that we're facing is pretty impressive. Don't be discouraged. The battle is not yours, but God's. Well, if it's not even my battle, why am I getting so worked up about all of it? If it's not even my battle, why am I stressing about it? If it's God's battle, when's the last time he lost one? I mean, we're not talking about the Chicago Cubs here. When's the last time he lost a battle? He never has. Why am I so stressed? It's not even my battle. So, the battle isn't mine. If I really understood that, if I believed that, it's going to change how I feel. If it changes how I feel it might start to change how I think. 
And if it changes how I think, it's going to start to change how I behave. And if I really take it to heart, I can slowly become one of those annoying people that doesn't seem to get bothered by stuff. You know, the one waiting for the table at the restaurant that seems just happy to be there. My parents did a really nice job Friday night. We went out to dinner and we went out with, Rhonda explained it to me, my first cousin once removed. He's actually my mom's cousin, but they're 18 years apart and he and I are two years apart. So as growing up, we spent the time together. And the reservation was at seven. Well, mom and dad showed up at 6.30 and sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there. Rhonda and I walked in at seven. And I was already annoyed because we couldn't go sit down. My parents are a lot more patient than me. It's a good thing. And it's like, well, when is the reservation? Reservation's at 7. It's 7.01! See, if, if I understand that this isn't my battle, I don't have to be that guy. I can be the one who's actually pleasant to be around. I can be the one who's actually paying attention to the people around me and seeing how I can help. There aren't a lot of folks like that in our culture today. So, the Apostle Paul goes on telling us how to deal with the struggle that we're in. And he says, going on in Ephesians 6, Therefore, Pastor Ron has told us for years, anytime you see the word therefore, look and see what it's there for. He's referring to what he just said about the battle not being ours and about the battle not being with people. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. He didn't say fight. He said resist. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. He didn't say advancing. He said standing. That tells me that it's not my job to fight. It's simply my job to stay where God put me. To do what God told me to do. The pressure is just leaving like crazy. He goes on in verse 14. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. We talked about all this stuff in pretty good detail. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. That's what we talked about for the last three weeks. Three weeks on one Bible verse. It's going to take us another 100,000 years to get through the rest of the Bible. Then we come to the last verse. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're going to talk today about the first part of that verse. So, when we learned about armor of God when I was in Sunday school and stuff, we called it the helmet of salvation. So, of course, you know me, you know the first thing I'm going to do is ask some questions. So, what is salvation? Well, in John 3, 16, you may be familiar with this verse. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I'm always amazed how few people go on to the next verse. In verse 17, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world. Why do so many people think Jesus is ticked off? The Bible says he's not. He didn't come here to judge the world. He came here to save the world through him. Salvation is being saved. Now, in the Old Testament, there are three words that were used for the concept of salvation. They're all very closely related. One is Yeshua. You think, that's not a word for salvation. That's Jesus 
name. Do you know that Jesus' name means salvation? The other word is Yesha. Yeshua, Yesha, okay, yeah. And then Tashua. They all mean pretty much the same thing. They all mean ah, to be rescued, delivered, or made safe in a physical or spiritual sense. That's what salvation is. In regards to the New Testament, the word doesn't change a whole lot. It means deliverance, preservation, safety from the attack or damage of enemies. It means that which concludes to the soul's safety or ultimate protection. So salvation involves what's happening to us now here. Salvation involves what happened to us in the past. And salvation involves what's going to happen to God's kids. The sum of the benefits and blessings which Christians redeemed from all earthly ills will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the completed, finished, and eternal kingdom of God. That is salvation. A lot of times, we as religious people pick one of those definitions and try and explain everything with that. There are some Christians who think that salvation only means heaven. You can live through hell on earth and there's nothing that anybody can do about it, but you get to go to heaven. And that's not wrong. But salvation also includes what God is doing for us now. Salvation includes what God has done for us in the past. When we were sitting at dinner Friday night, we were talking and mom was talking about things that her grandma had written. Now, her grandma died in 1978. Her grandma, to tell you how old of a Californian my family is, her grandma was born in Corona in the 1880s. Corona was such a small town then that it only had one Starbucks. But the funny thing is, do you know that there were things that my great-grandma and great-grandpa did that affected me? The Christian heritage that they raised their family in affected me. Things God did for the McIntosh family 140 years ago affects me, which means it affects my kids, which means it will affect their kids. So the way traditional theologians explain this is they say, we have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved. And we need to remember all three of those. We can't be so self-centered that we're only sticking with we will be saved. So, Let me move my notes here. As a quick review, and by the way, all that is good news. I can remember the first time I heard my friend Mike Warnke say, if the good news is the gospel, why do so many Christians look like this? (laughs) And I laughed because I thought, he's got a point. But as a quick review, where does our salvation come from? Well, the Apostle Paul, of course, spends a bunch of time in his letters answering this very question. Here are some highlights. We don't have time to go into detail, but we have over the last several years. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, Once we, too, were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to the many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. In other words, United States 2022. (laughs) 
folks, if evolution was true, we would have changed a little by now. Human beings don't change. Human nature is human nature. And our need for God does not change. Paul goes on in verses 4 and 5, but when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Who can tell me what tense the word saved is? That means he's done it. He has saved us. Not because of the righteous things we've done, (laughs) but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins. Did he cover them? No, he washed them away giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who saved us. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. That's a really nice What is salvation in a nutshell? In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8, he says, God saved. Saved. She's already done it. Saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Strangely enough, that's one of the biggest problems a lot of people have with Christianity. Because we, as humans, love to take credit for stuff. And as much as I'd like to think I did this, I did not do this. God did. In verse 9, salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So guess what? People who believe in Jesus are not better than people who don't. People who believe in Jesus can be every much a bit of a jerk as other people. (laughs) There was a bumper sticker that was really popular when I was in high school. It said, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And I thought, well, I'm a Christian. I'm forgiven. Can I slap you? It's not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. That word masterpiece is a big word. And I love that it doesn't say, you are God's masterpiece. I can't read that and say, I am God's masterpiece. He says, we, God's family, are God's masterpiece, together. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. As part of God's family, we can be the people he intended for us to be when he started this whole process. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This isn't even Mike up here. It's Christ who lives in me. Well, why don't you always act like it? Because I'm stupid and I make bad decisions. Sometimes. Just like everyone else. But I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. Boy, that's a tough one. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. 
My theology professor put it this way. If I can make myself right with God on my own, God murdered his son. Because there was no need for him to die. But I can't do it on my own. This is something that Jesus did for me. Our salvation comes when we believe, when we trust in and when we put our faith in what Jesus has done for us. He paid the price for our sin when he died on the cross as us. It was paid in full. When he rose from the dead, he defeated, he utterly defeated the source of death and suffering, sin. You know, sin is defeated. Why I keep picking it up and trying to shock it back to life, I don't know. But sin is defeated. And we were made absolutely right with God. In other words, we have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. And that's good news. So, how do we put on salvation as a helmet? What does that even mean? Of course, a good helmet protects our head. I've told you all through this thing. I've got three helmets that I like at my house that I wear on my motorcycle depending on what the weather is like. If it's cold, I put on my full face helmet. If it's nice, I put on my open face helmet. That way the rest of the world can benefit from this. <laughs> if it's really hot, I put on my littler helmet that lets air get through. Because there's not a whole lot worse than ruining a good motorcycle ride with wet hair. Oh man, when I had long hair, riding my motorcycle, was it? man, it would just get this rat's nest back there. It was funny. And Rhonda would say, why don't you just cut it off? And I'd say, no, I'm never cutting my hair. <laughs> but remember, our head is the most important part of our body. Not only does our head hold the stuff that makes us us, it controls every other part of our body. Our head is so good at it that we don't even have to think about most of what our body does. No one is sitting in this room going, come on, you got to remember, in, out, in, out. For most of us, it just happens kind of naturally. There's all sorts of stuff that just happens naturally. If you drop something, you don't think, oh, wait, if I let go of it, which direction does it fall? Oh, wait, it falls down. So I need to put something under the glass and the tile that it's going to land on which hand should I use, left or right? Ah, let's do right. We don't want to, you know, be picky or discriminate. I'll reach down. And, you see, we can't do that. Have you ever watched a baby learning to walk? They literally are having to think, what do I do? You and I don't. We just think, I want to go that way. And we start going this way. Oh, wait. I forget why I came in here. <laughs> I might as well go back that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that happened to me yesterday. I went three different places and kept finding things that I had set down because I forgot what I was doing. Our brains, our minds control all of this. So the truth is, if you wear every other piece of armor but don't protect your head, it's not going to do a whole lot of good for you. I can remember when I was a kid and I'd see some biker go by and he's wearing leather pants and a leather jacket and no helmet. It's like, well, good. Your arms and your legs will be in good shape when they scrape the rest of you off the ground. We got to protect our head. 
We've got to understand our salvation. We've got to live in our salvation. Otherwise, the rest of it's not going to accomplish a whole lot. Look at what these verses say about salvation and the confidence that it gives us. You know that if I really understand what it is God has done for me and who I am because of what, is, what God has done for me, it changes how I think. Back in the olden days, when, say, my dad was a kid, football players wore basically a leather grocery sack on their head. And interestingly enough, football players didn't suffer the injuries back then that they do now. And I was watching a very interesting study, and they were saying the better helmets have gotten, the stupider football players have treated their bodies because they will stick their heads in places their heads ought not go. Why? A good helmet gives you confidence. You're not afraid anymore. You're not intimidated anymore. You're not distracted anymore. All my life, I've been a huge drag racing fan. And I can remember when these guys would race their cars with these little open face strap-on helmets and t-shirts. Nowadays, it's like a robot's coming out because they're completely surrounded and they've got these massive helmets on. But very few people get hurt anymore. So if you're wearing a helmet that you know is a good helmet, it gives you confidence. I wonder if the Bible has anything to say about confidence. In 1 John chapter 5, in verse 11, it says, and this is what God has testified. First of all, it didn't say this is what God said. It doesn't say this is what God planned to do. This is what God testified. That is a legal term. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. In verse 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. As a Christian, I have the Son. He lives in me. Therefore, I have life. You know what the worst thing that can happen to me down here on earth is? My body stops functioning. And where do I go? Heaven. The worst thing that can happen to me isn't really even a bad thing for me. If something was to happen to me, it's all of you who would suffer endlessly. But look at what he goes on to in verse 13. I've written this to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. And we are confident. What is confidence? It's the strong belief that what you think needs to happen will happen. We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Now, once again, not a lot of people read that verse. They stick to verse 15. And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he'll give us what we ask for. That is a stupid verse if you don't read the one before it. I have asked for some ridiculous things. And strangely enough, I haven't gotten them. I wonder if I can back up. Yes. He hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. When we ask for something that he wants to give us, He responds. Then we know 
that he'll give us what we ask for. Why? Because he wants to give it to us anyway. We can't allow our mindset of 2022 United States of America to think he's talking about a car. (laughs) Dear Lord, how superficial is that? He's talking about what pleases him. Oh, please, God, I have always wanted a kitty cat car. I mean a jaguar. (laughs) Why hasn't God moved? That's a very different prayer. Then please, God, people need to know you. How can I help them know you? You see the difference? I really don't think God cares what kind of car you drive. I do know that the most spiritual car is the Honda Accord. Because on the day of Pentecost, all of Jesus' followers were in one accord. In 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Yep, that's where we're going. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. See, Paul enjoyed talking about this armor thing. But our salvation should give us confidence. Confidence to do what God has called us to do. When we understand that we are saved, that we are being saved, and we will be saved, we are free to do whatever God tells us to. We are free to do what he created us to do in the first place. One of the things I learned from my dad was that tools exist for a reason. And if you use them to do what they were designed to do, they'll last. My best friend in high school, Rob, had a different rule. The McGregor rule of car repair, number one. When in need, anything is a hammer. Strangely enough, crescent wrenches don't last that long when you use them as hammers. There are people sitting out here this morning that have attempted to use a screwdriver as a chisel. Even worse, they've attempted to use a chisel as a screwdriver. I hesitate to think of the things we tried to use as a car jack. But when you use things for what they were designed to do, good stuff happens. Truth is, I prefer driving my Mustang to driving a school bus. But if I've got to transport 70 kids somewhere, I'll take the bus because I don't want to have to make 70 different trips. You use things for what they're designed for. We seem to want to use this for what we want to do with it, not what God wants to do with it. But when we are confident, when we're wearing our helmet of salvation, we can do what God created us to do, which is spread his love to the people around us. When we can be confident and not afraid, we can trust in him, and the amazing armor that he's given each of us. Salvation is so much more than just going to heaven. It's not just what you were saved for or from, it's what you were saved for. And that confidence will change your life. 
So, how are we getting dressed to stand firm against the attacks of our enemy, the devil? How are we making sure that we're wearing each piece of the armor that God has given us? Because remember, it's up to us. My motorcycle helmet does me no good sitting on the shelf in my garage. It's up to us to get dressed. <laughs> we used to live over in Arlanza, and we had a neighbor that lived in front of us. And it didn't happen all the time, but it happened enough that it quit being surprising. And one of her little kids would just show up at our front door, naked. <laughs> Hi. Oh, you better go home and put some drawers on. And then the mom would come running around, ah, I can't do it, no, 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 no. And he just forgot to get dressed. You know, and as an adult, I'm thinking, you know, there are places I don't ever want to get sunburned. I wonder how many times I've gone out and forgot to get dressed. And we need to put on our helmet. Why? Because we'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And after the battle, we will be standing firm. Standing firm means strong, healthy, doing what God told us to do. Now next week, I think we'll finish up but we'll have to see. Who knows? Maybe half a verse will take us a month. But this is good stuff. God is so generous and good to us. I hope we start to appreciate it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to get together with our church family and to spend some time with you together. You are so good to us and you help us, you meet us, you show us how much you love us all the time in many different ways, and we appreciate that. Father, whatever you have us doing this week, I know that your hand of blessing and protection will be on us, and you can bring us back safely next weekend, and we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.